As you can tell from the length of this video, which is less than an hour, this is not a full review of the Red Komodo, although I will be sharing a lot of my thoughts about it. This video is mainly about using the Fujinon MK Cinema Zoom lenses with the Komodo, but also with the Canon C70 and R5. If you don't know what makes the Super 35mm Fujinon MK lenses so special, then you will by the end of this video. I've used and owned the MKs for quite a while now, longer than I thought in fact. When I pulled up the first test footage that I shot with them for Fuji, it was all the way back in December of 2016. This footage was just using the 18-55 T2.9. And then a few months later, I did the same with the 50-135 to T2.9, when that was ready for testing. Initially, these lenses were just for the Sony E-mount system, but they also made them for their own cameras, the X-mount. A lot of people have asked for them in EF or PL, but what made Fujinon able to make them the size and weight that they are is the short flange distance of mirrorless cameras. They're just 980 grams each, which for a cinema lens of this quality is very light. To compare, the Sigma 18 to 35 millimeter cinema lens is almost 1.5 kilograms. And this is for the EF mount versions. A couple of years ago, Fuji hired me again to test out these lenses with the Micro Four Thirds mount. So I got a couple sent to me from MTF services and I switched out my E-mount for the Micro Four Thirds mount to use with my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. And they worked really well, it's just that the sensor is smaller than Super 35mm, so the 18 35 wasn't quite wide enough for me at that wide end. But it did mean you gained more on the long end. I've always thought it was a shame that Blackmagic gave the Pocket 6K an EF mount, as it really limited what lenses you could put on there. A nice mirrorless mount would have meant you could adapt all sorts of lenses to that camera. And now here I am again, risking my life in these incredibly treacherous rapids of flooded Richmond upon Thames to test out the lenses with an RF mount, specifically with the Red Komodo. Whilst I was intrigued by the Red Komodo, I didn't have any intention of buying one as I absolutely didn't need it. The only things it offered me over my numerous other cameras were two main things, a global shutter and the wonderful R3D raw codec. Having a global shutter is a lovely thing to have, but it hasn't been high up on my list of features for a video camera. My style of shooting is very classical and mostly tripod based. I do shoot handheld when I'm filming actuality for documentaries, but the cameras that I use for that are proper video cameras and they generally have minimal rolling shutter. I do have many cameras that shoot raw, but none of them have a raw codec which is as good as R3D. It is by far, in my opinion, the best out there. With its variable compression levels, full post adjustment for ISO, white balance, integrated really well into the major NLEs and their end software is superb. Even in Adobe Premiere, editing it natively is an absolute breeze. So whilst I absolutely didn't need this camera, in a moment of gas weakness, I bought one that had suddenly become available at my dealer. And after playing with it for a little bit, I thought this would be a great camera to use with MK lenses. They should make an RF mount for them. So thinking it was a bright idea, I emailed it to Fuji and they told me that they already knew it was a bright idea because both MTF services and Duclos lenses had conversion kits for them. Yes, I should have Googled it. The Micro Four Thirds mount was pretty easy to switch out from the E-mount lens. The RF mount is more complicated and is not recommended for people to do themselves. 
so I borrowed a couple of already converted ones rather than mess around with my own EMAT ones so I could see how well they work together. Whilst these lenses are light, almost the same weight as the Canon 24-70 2.8 L series, both the EF and the RF one, which is a little bit lighter, I found that I needed to use rod support when using them with the Komodo. When I didn't, there was some movement when I touched the lens, I zoomed and focused. When using the E-mount ones on my Sony cameras, they're very tight on that mount. But I did notice some wobble also on the Micro Four Thirds mount with the Blackmagic camera. This does seem to be a camera issue though, not the lens mount itself. Because when I put the RF ones on my Canon R5, they were rock solid. But we'll talk more about the R5 later. Other than the weight being so light, there are many things that make these lenses so special. They're identical in every way except their focal range. The same weight, filter diameter of 82mm and their physical length. They both have the same T2.9 aperture, which is a true constant aperture throughout the range. The optics are from the superb and much more expensive Cabrio line, so there's minimal distortion and chromatic aberration. They're sharp as attack and have really gorgeous bokeh. The lenses are parfocal, so as long as your back focus is set correctly, when you have your focus, no matter where you go in the zoom range, it will still be in focus. There's just a handful of photographic zoom lenses which are like this, as it isn't an important factor for photography. The mechanics of the lens are gorgeous, smooth, with just the right amount of resistance. The focus rotation is 200 degrees, which for me is the perfect amount for operation without a focus puller. You can go from close focus to infinity with one turn of your wrist. Most cinema lenses are 300 degrees, so you will need a follow focus for one of those, maybe even the focus puller. Focus breathing is at an absolute bare minimum, something which can't be said for a lot of other cinema lenses and almost all stills lenses. The minimum focus distance of the 1855 isn't as close as I would like. It's 85 centimeters, but with the macro switch, you can bring that down to 38 centimeters when you are at 18 millimeters. The 50 to 135 has a minimum focus of 120 centimeters, and with that macro switch, you could bring it down to 85 centimeters, again at the wide end. That macro minimum focus distance will increase the more you zoom in on both lenses. The Focus Zoom and Iris all have the industry standard pitch gear, so you can add on your follow focuses, etc. They have an image circle of 28.5 millimeters, which is big enough to cover the Komodo sensor. The Komodo has a larger than usual Super 35 millimeter sensor of 27.03 millimeters by 13.26, giving it a crop factor to a full frame sensor of just 1.41 times. For comparison, the Canon C70 is 1.46, and that's DCI 4K. If you go to UHD, it's 1.5. The Sony FS7 is 1.5, and the standard Arri Alexa, 1.52 times. Oh yeah, the Blackmagic Pocket 6K is 1.56 times. The Komodo image is very nice, especially at 6K. It's just a shame that the frame rates aren't higher. When shooting at 17 by nine, in 6K, the highest you can go is 40 frames per second. If you drop down to a 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, you can squeeze an extra 10 frames per second out of it. If you want to go higher than that, you have to crop in on the sensor. For 60p, you need to go to 4K. And for 120p, you need to go to 2K. The obvious downside to this is you're just going to end up tighter each time you go to a lower resolution. 
but also you're going to see more noise and that's definitely the case when you go to 2k cropping the sensor is the way that red have always done their high frame rates if you want to go higher you've got to crop in more and that's why you really need to make sure that you have really sharp glass if you are going to be cropping in i think for me this is the single biggest dislike about the komodo i just wish they were higher there are of course numerous cameras out there that outperform the Komodo in high frame rates, although none of them have global shutters and most don't have internal RAW, but they are capable of external RAW. Sadly I don't have a Canon C70 which is the only other cinema camera out there with an RF mount, so I wasn't able to test the MKs with it. Has a great super 35mm video camera which can do 4K up to 120 frames per second, has a really lovely image and very nice autofocus. But I did test out the MKs with the Canon R5, which is a camera I absolutely adore. It does have those well documented overheating issues, but they are much improved. It's an exceptional stills camera and also a really terrific video camera capable of producing beautiful images. It can shoot an 8K, but that is full frame. 4K has an HQ mode that super samples that full sensor to give a perfect looking 4K. And both those modes max out at 30p, as well as a line skipped standard mode, which goes all the way up to 120 frames per second. Again, using the full sensor. The camera does have a 1.6x APS-C crop mode in 4K that lets you shoot up to 60p. And it looks better than the line skipped standard full frame mode. And I bet you think that's what I'm shooting in right now, don't you? Well, it isn't. I am in fact shooting in 8K. Yep, I am using the Super 35mm Fujinon MK lenses in the full frame 8K mode of the Canon R5. And it looks fantastic. And no, I am not cropping the image in post to lose the vignette. The 1.6x APS-C crop mode is the most sensible mode to shoot in with this, but there is a sneaky workaround or hack, if you will, to shoot in 8K and 4K up to 120p, despite these being full frame modes. You see, the R5 doesn't only have IBIS as stabilization, it also has two digital IS modes, which crop in on the sensor to give you additional stabilization. It then upscales internally to maintain the resolution. So it's more than enough to let you shoot in 8K with the MK lenses on the Canon R5. Now there is a caveat though, you do need to manually input the focal length in the camera's menu as there is no electronic communication between the lens and the camera so it doesn't know what focal length you're at. So it is a bit of a pain because there's no way of creating a shortcut for this option in the camera. If you don't put in the right focal length, when you move the camera, there's a very good chance you're gonna get some strange things. If you're static on a tripod, it won't make any difference. Just when you pan or tilt, you need to make sure that it is set correctly. When shooting handheld, it's of course even more important to input that correct focal length. When you're shooting in APS-C crop mode, turn off that digital IS unless you want to get an even more cropped image for a tighter shot. When shooting handheld, you're more likely to keep changing your zoom position. But if you are taking your time with it, you can use the IBIS. And when you do have that correct focal length in it, it's gonna give you some really nice handheld. Whilst it is fiddly, 
for me, it's worth it to use these lenses to be able to shoot in 8K and 4K 120 frames per second. If you're using the Komodo with them, you don't need to worry about any of this nonsense because there's no stabilization in the camera. Instead, you have the marvelous global shutter. If you're really shaky, it's not gonna make your handheld any smoother. It will just look less jittery. You see, glass is always a better investment than cameras, as they're pretty much always going to see you through many cameras. After all, my MKs were bought with E-mounts. I've adapted them to Micro Four Thirds and put them back to E-mounts. And yes, I can put on RF now. For now, they are going to remain on E-mounts as my main camera is the Sony FX6. And whilst it is full frame, I can set it to 1.3 times clear image zoom and it will work fantastically. If I want to use them with the Komodo, I would need to buy the RF conversion kits from a dealer who stocks either the MTF services or Duclos versions and get them to convert them. And of course you can buy the lenses already fitted with the RF mounts because if you don't actually have the lenses and you want them for RF mount, then that's what you should be doing. Whichever camera you end up using them with, I'm sure you're falling in love with them, just like I did all those years ago.